Hello, welcome to What's Next in Spacecraft Thermal Control. Uh, my name is Brian Muzika. I'll be kind of co-hosting with you here today, and I will be joined by Ryan Spangler. So both Ryan and I work uh, very heavily in the spacecraft industry. Um, so myself on the business development and marketing side, working with a lot of customers to kind of define requirements and figure out what thermal solutions might be applicable. And Ryan, uh, more on a hands-on role, working through the engineering side, um, the NRE phases, as well as the product development and build phases of the various products we're going to show today. So please, as we go on, ask as many questions as possible, um, and we will get to them all either at the end or we'll follow up with a um, secondary email responding to all questions we received today. So just to give a quick background, if any of you have not uh, kind of been aware of ACT, we are a um, thermal management solutions provider, and we were founded in 2003 and have been kind of growing ever since. Um, we here in Lancaster have around 150 employees and 80,000 square feet. We also um, acquired a facility in, in York, Pennsylvania, which has um, another additional 60,000 square feet. So we have been kind of expanding and a lot of that has been due to the kind of growth in the space industry, as well as some of our other verticals. Um, we do a fair amount of work in the defense, medical, as well as power electronics and industrial applications as well. Um, over our history, we've been recognized a couple times. Um, what some of the um, ones we're very proud of are the Tibbetts Award, um, which is a SBIR award for commercialization. So a lot of our work with NASA and the DOD um, becomes products and is integrated into systems. Uh, we've been given outstanding supplier awards um, from numerous customers um, that you can probably see on our website. And we've been three-time winner of the top 100 best places to work in Pennsylvania. So we always have a kind of core value of working not only with our customers, but with our employees to have a very good workplace. So today we're gonna touch on kind of a lot. Um, we're gonna try to go through and give kind of a high-level overview of not only what's currently being used, but what's upcoming in the space industry. So we're gonna start with just a kind of basic heat pipe overview, if any of you are unfamiliar, but we won't dive too deep, deeply into it. So if you do have questions or want more details, there's other webinars and there's also, you feel free to reach out to us directly and we can answer those questions. But we're gonna look at a couple different areas of spacecraft thermal control. One is um, kind of local heat spreading. We're gonna look at transporting heat uh, long distances from components to radiator panels. We're gonna look at um, thermal control aspects, and then we're also gonna look at rejecting the heat uh, via radiators. And we're gonna wrap things up with a, a case study on some of our recent work on the, the NASA VIPE program. So just diving right in, um, we're gonna start with a basic heat pipe overview. Uh, if you have joined our webinars before, you probably have seen this slide before, so I, I won't spend too much time on it. But just to give kind of a, a background, because a lot of the technologies we'll talk about utilize passive two-phase heat transfer, and a heat pipe is a good example of why that's um, beneficial, especially in a spacecraft environment. So the way a heat pipe works is it, it takes in heat, um, whether it's a temperature difference across the length or whether it's a, a power source at, at the evaporator end, it takes in that heat, it creates a, um, a vaporization wherever it's hotter in the pipe, that vapor is pushed to wherever it's colder with the internal pressure gradients, and then it rejects it, it gives up its latent heat, rejects, um, and then condenses back to a liquid. And on the ID of the pipe, there is a wick structure, and we'll talk about a couple different varieties of, of heat pipes that utilize different wick structures, but there's a wick structure that passively pumps that fluid from the, the colder condenser end back to the hotter evaporator end. So the, the benefits from a spacecraft's perspective is it's it's completely passive so no moving parts no power required um, but it also does give very efficient heat transfer because of that latent heat of vaporization and the two phase aspects and just we're not going to touch on a lot of um, different fluids but i, I did want to kind of give um, a, a broad view of heat pipe technology there is a lot of options out there um, so we're going to focus on a couple different areas, um, primarily water and ammonia, you'll, you'll hear a lot about, but there are a lot of options and almost all of these are utilized in the space industry. Um, we've had 
programs where we're working on you know products going to Venus that are going to use very high temperature or products going to um, you know Jupiter or deep space that are going to use very low temperature working fluids. So um, there is a kind of a variety and depending on your operational zone, um, you're going to select a different working fluid for different missions. Um, but for the sweet spots in satellite, lunar landers, and things like that, um, water and um, ammonia are, are the most traditionally used, so that's where we'll focus a lot of our time. So with that, we just kind of wanted to jump in, and before we start talking specifically about products, give kind of an overview of the difference, differences between ammonia and water heat pipes. So ammonia is probably the most well-known in the spacecraft industry, used on um, most geosynchronous satellites, uh, most high power satellites, and they're, they're used to transport heat long distances. So getting heat from payloads out to radiators, um, they can be embedded within radiators and they can be configured into a lot of different um, geometries. So it's a very nice working fluid and it also can operate across a, a pretty wide range that is good for deep space environment. Um, and you also don't have to worry about in a, in a deep space environment below zero, worry about freezing because ammonia has a much lower operating temperature than water. Um, on the water side, it does have a space in spacecraft thermal control. Um, it, it is utilized a lot because of the heat flux capability. So we'll talk about that as we go through some examples, but it does have a much higher heat flux uh, capability than ammonia. So for short distance heat transfer um, at the component level, it's utilized a lot and it can be integrated into um, solid aluminum for heat spreading and it's kind of an emerging technology so um, a lot of those satellites or, or spacecraft that have onboard computing requirements have higher heat densities they're starting to look at um, copper water heat pipes as a potential solution to get the heat um, locally spread out so that you don't run into heat flux issues or localized um, heating issues. So with that, we're going to talk now about heat spreading. So we're, we're talking about the board level where your electronics are mounted to the board. And the goal here uh, from a thermal challenge um, is going to be transporting heat from the components to the edge of the board. That's, that's the most local heat transport path that you have to worry about. And then secondary to that, if you have multiple boards per a chassis, it's, it's getting the heat um, spread along the chassis. So taking that, that heat and moving it to wherever it's coupling with your, your next level uh, thermal design. So a lot of times that's done at the base of the chassis where it couples with either a radiator or maybe an ammonia C CCHP to transfer farther out, but that's really the goal of spreading um, from, the, from the component to the edge and then along the chassis to wherever it's coupling with your ultimate heat sink. And just talking a little bit about the common technologies, um, probably the most common because most spacecraft avoid very high heat flux chips traditionally has been just using very lightweight, um, thin metal heat spreaders. So um, aluminum, for instance, 6061 has a thermal conductivity of 167 watts per meter K. And that, in a lot of times, a lot of applications is, is good enough to, to perform your local spreading. Um, thermal straps have also been used that can couple components directly to um, kind of a, the chassis or the edge of the radiator. And that also provides some flexible link as well if you have components moving relative to one another. But those are kind of the, the most common, the most proven, um, and are very easy to work with technologies. What you do run into in both those is a um, bottleneck if the thermal conductivity of the base material is not good enough. So that's where you get into some of the performance enhancers we're going to talk about, which is space copper water heat pipes, as well as um, embedded space copper water heat pipes into high K plates. So just real quick on space copper water heat pipes, um, we have a lot of information on our website if you want more information and, and Ryan has been involved in a lot of these qualification programs so he can um, touch on a lot of details. I'll probably ask him to come on um, during the slide and, and touch to some of those you know, testing requirements and, and so forth. But just to give kind of a quick update on why they're used, they're used, as you can see in the top right figure, for localized heat transfer, usually one or two components taking the heat and moving it out to the board edge. 
And the reason they're used is because of their heat flux capability. So um, what we have highlighted there is they can handle heat flux up to 50 watts per centimeter square, which is much higher, an order of magnitude higher than ammonia can, can handle. And <clears throat> really from getting heat from, from point A to point B, where that distance is a fairly short distance, water is an ideal working fluid and can be used very efficiently in these types of applications. So where it's used, um, avionics, embedded computing um, that are involved in the, the payload. So again, both at the board level, as you can see in the example there, but also in the chassis level to move heat down to the base where it's coupling with your ultimate heat sink. Um, and we have seen some interest in usage in CubeSat or SmallSat panels. If you have um, you know, your radiator and you're mounting directly to your radiator and your radiator may or may not be a um, aluminum, thin plate aluminum, you can mount directly to that and have the heat heat pipes spread the heat on that panel. So yeah, maybe I'll ask Ryan to kind of talk. We've, we've gone through a couple of qualification efforts and he could talk to a lot to the you know testing and some of the challenges involved since water does freeze in these types of applications. All right, yeah, <clears throat> thanks Brian. So uh, I'll do my best to stumble through this. So probably the most important thing to understand is relative to a terrestrial application where copper water heat pipes are operating you know, 40 to 70, 80 degrees C, um, it's not quite as straightforward as just modeling a thermal resistance. Uh, and there are certain aspects of the design that need to be taken into consideration when designing for uh, space copper water heat pipe for the highest probability of success. There's aspect ratios, um, secondary conduction paths, et cetera, that you kind of have to have an intimate understanding of uh, to design for. And that's kind of the value add that we provide. As far as the uh, qualification test plan. There's not really a, an industry standard at this point as to how that should be conducted. So ACT as a whole now has, as Brian mentioned, uh, quite a bit of experience in uh, performing and also helping uh, tune qualification and or acceptance test regimens for your specific mission profile. Um, there's a lot of different ways. Ironically, if you think about it, I say freeze thaw of a heat pipe, you think of one way water freezes. But really, um, it's all about distribution of the working fluid into the heat pipe um, and best predicting you know, how long that system can survive. Each freeze thaw cycle does provide accumulated damage to the wick structure. Um, so you don't want to exhaust, you know, if you have to survive 100 cycles in flight, you don't want to put 100 cycles on it in order to verify that that would work because by the time you get it, it's already exhausted. Um, so figuring out the best test to perform to mimic the appropriate freeze thaw distribution, um, how many cycles to give high confidence in the design is something that, that we can help uh, help you tune for your program. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. And there's a lot of upfront um, you know, design and development work that can help mitigate those risks. And as Ryan said, we do have a lot of experience, but although there is kind of some qualification effort behind the technology specific to every application, um, it is ultimately, in a majority of cases, the best technology to get um, significant high heat flux um, component heat density out and out to your board as efficiently as possible so that overall your, your entire system can operate as efficient as possible. And just kind of moving on to one variation of space copper water heat pipes that's where we fully embed them into aluminum plates so a technology we've um, trademarked as as high k high thermal co conductivity plates um, it's a fairly simple procedure we mill out screws um, nickel plate both the um, pipes as well as the plates press the heat pipes in and do a solder procedure and a secondary machining operation to come up with a very flat profile plate that, that mimics the geometry you're looking for and has all the uh, mechanical features you'd like, but it does give um, a thermal conductivity enhancement from the 167 we talked about for aluminum um, 6061 up to 500 to 1200 watts per meter K. And that ranges a lot of, it's dependent on how your components are laid out as well as how large the plate is because the heat pipes are pretty much going to have a consistent delta T of, of two to five degrees across their length. So it's how you kind of organize them and how large the plate is to what the, the overall thermal conductivity. But that's a fairly consistent range we found um, in developing a lot of these models and then actually going back to our models and um, 
keeping a consistent thermal conductivity that matches test results. So we'll keep adjusting it until we match our test results. And usually we're within the 500 to 1200 watts per meter K range. And you can see some examples there. The top right is um, actually a plate that was our first test article for space that, that flew on the ISS and, and did some testing. And then the bottom figures are some um, examples of, of six U cards to the left where you can see the before and after of heat pipes and then some um, terrestrial applications that we've done both embedding heats into kind of a, a chassis level, single board computer chassis level design, as well as a larger um, shipboard application where we embedded, um, I believe that plate had 64 heat pipes in it. Okay, so the, the next part, that's, that's kind of the um, area for heat spreading at the, the local component level. And now I'll talk about distant heat transport. Um, and if you've joined um, previous spacecraft webinars, you probably have heard about the, the common options being constant conductance heat pipes and, and loop heat pipes. Um, and then we'll get into some of the emerging options with um, 3D printed loop heat pipes. So um, yeah, we'll jump right in and talk about aluminum ammonia CCHPs. Um, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but this is um, more or less the the industry standard has been used for decades. Um, ammonia is a very beneficial working fluid for a spacecraft, and it is compatible with aluminum, which is an ideal envelope material because it's it's lightweight. You can easily uh, manipulate it into a lot of different geometries. But overall, you get significantly uh, look, you get very low temperature gradient across the length of the pipe. And as you can see, especially in the example to the top right, you can have multiple mounting surfaces to pick up heat at different areas along your spacecraft, as well as reject heat to different areas along your spacecraft. So you can see kind of the flexibility in some of the bending and routing, as well as some of the coatings there. But usually we can develop these to be suitable to a lot of different environments, whether they're embedded into panels or um, external to your spacecraft. So those kind of considerations are always um, kind of thought through with our customers. And then we, uh, we kind of come up with design and finalize a solution. Um, but in terms of performance, the transport capacity is mainly, as, as all heat pipes are, dependent on the diameter. But to give you kind of some sense, um, we took a couple of our, one of our smaller extrusions, the quarter inch extrusion, that has kind of a performance um, in the 600 watt inch range. Um, and then one of our larger extrusions, which is a one inch extrusion, has over uh, 25,000 watt inch. So depending on your length, you can kind of derive what, um, what power you can move on, on those pipes. And we do have those characterized for all our cores that have flown. So if you do have a, a power requirement and a distance, we can usually quickly iterate with you on how to come up with the, the appropriate um, solution. And in terms of heat flux capability, I, I alluded to it in the uh, water side, but it does have a lower heat flux capability. The groove wick structure that's um, very good for distance heat transport isn't quite as good for um, providing high heat flux capabilities and ammonia is just not as good of a working fluid as water for, for heat pipes. So um, those two combined, it does have a lower heat flux capability, but um, has been very efficient. If you can spread out that heat before it enters the, the aluminum ammonia heat pipe, it can get heat out to the radiators very, very efficiently. And we have flown these, um, so this is TRL-9. We have over 53 million hours on orbit and zero failures. And we have delivered over 1,000 um, flight qualified CCPs to various customers. And yeah, the, uh, the other kind of option um, is loop heat pipes. So um, I'll ask Ryan to come back on and, and talk through some of the, the loop heat pipes, but in General terms, it is um, just as it sounds. It's, it's a heat pipe that's created into a loop, but the difference technology is primarily in the evaporator section, which you can see kind of on the top of both these figures. But that is where all the more or less the magic happens. It creates kind of a passive pumping, and then all it's basically providing vapor throughout the system so that all your condenser lines and your uh, plumbing can be very um, flexible lining it doesn't need to um, be too rigid so that provides a lot of benefit to to loop heat pipes and i'll yeah i'll have ryan jump in and talk to some of the performance characteristics and manufacturing thanks brian um i'll do my best to stumble through this so as brian said the 
the evaporator, what we refer to as the pump body of the system is, is kind of like the loop heat pipe's heart, right? So all the wick structure is contained within the pump body. It's a compensation chamber, which is the big bulbous feature at the end of the flanged area on that bottom right-hand picture or the evaporator itself. So there's a primary wick structure that has a very small pore radius, and we have the number here. It's generally around one micron um, and a one inch diameter. So we do develop, fabricate that in-house. The benefit of the very small uh, pore radius is, you know, there's no wick anywhere else in the system. So that wick structure combined with what's called a knife edge seal allows vapor to travel only in one direction through the vapor transport lines. Makes it to the condenser, condenses, returns through the liquid line, through the compensation chamber back to the primary wick and you have this closed loop. Um, because it's such a small pore radius, you get a very high capillary pressure. So one of the major benefits uh, of this technology is ground testability. So where for CCHPs, you have to be very cognizant because they don't have a small pore radius. You can only test up to generally a tenth of an inch. These have demonstrated uh, heights in excess of 60 inches. Uh, so 60 inches or more of uh, gravity adverse liquid return. Uh, they generally have tremendously high conductances. Again, we've demonstrated uh, over 100 watts per K, which is phenomenal. They can move you know, 1,000 1, watts of power or more over very long distances. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility that can be put into the system, and I mean that quite literally. We can introduce flexible regions of the transport lines for deployable mechanisms. Um, you can have multiple condensers that are on or off depending on the temperature that they see. Um, if the condenser gets too hot, you won't have to worry about the uh, returning liquid influencing the temperature of the pump body because it doesn't have a wick, it just drains all the fluid and occupies a different condenser. And you can also get some thermal control on the cold side if you want to prevent your evaporator from descending too much by heating the compensation chamber. That's traditional. Um, so very attractive technology, enables a lot of very nifty things in spacecraft thermal control. The caveat then being the cost and lead time to fabricate. There's two, what I'll flag is very high risk processes. One is the primary wick insertion. To get those thermal conductances, it's a thermal interference fit. Um, and any misalignment of the wick going into the body, which we heat the body up to 300 plus 3C, cool the wick down, uh, you get about 0.01 of an inch gap to work with. Any misalignment over a 10 plus inch length uh, exponentially increases the risk of it getting caught and uh, scrapped. So we have to carry a lot of spares. Then there's also the knife edge seal, which I already mentioned. It's kind of responsible for keeping vapor moving in one direction. Um, it is very much a, uh, I would say a, a plastic deformation that needs to occur at the wick. Uh, you increase the probability of forming a crack and losing your pore radius as discussed and getting additional heat leaks back affecting the performance. And that kind of takes us to what would be the emerging technology. Um, and we'll just wait for the slide to change here. 3D printed loop heat pipe. So um, this is this one I'm pretty excited about and, and it's garnered uh, a decent amount of attention in the industry. Um, basically, what we have here is we're printing the primary wick, the envelope, and the uh, vapor grooves all simultaneously in one process. So you have a picture in a couple different angles here on the right. The top uh, right shows the external envelope surrounding the primary wick structure, and you have a little section view right below that. And then the bottom left picture there shows the vapor grooves exiting out the uh, vapor plenum region. Uh, so what this does is, is kind of attacks those high risk uh, processes that I just mentioned. So because you're printing the envelope uh, or wick, I should say, integral to the envelope, you no longer need to do that thermal interference fit. Um, and you can also print a solid uh, surface at the back end, which is attaching to the compensation chamber. So you don't need a knife edge uh, to prevent backflow. It's all done. Uh, by design. So you get significantly faster turn on uh, on a loop heat pipe system using this technology and it, it generally comes out considerably cheaper uh, because you don't have to carry quite as many spares and you know you're paying for print not the individual parts that need to then come together. 
Um, we have to date demonstrated this with stainless steel. That's where most of our development has been. Um, and you can see in the bottom right hand picture, um, a function of pore radius versus the time that we've had to develop it. So we went from being in the 9, 10 micron range down to about five or, or less uh, here over about a year. Um, so we're not quite to the one micron pore radius that we see with traditional loop heat pipes, which does mean that in general, it's not gonna carry as much power, but we do show a positive trend in that direction and it'll continue. We anticipate getting better as the technology evolves. So if we go on to the next slide, what does this all mean? Um, well, we have printed it, built it into a loop, actually several loops and demonstrated uh, its ability to perform well with a variety of working fluids, I believe ammonia and propylene to date. Um, I have some pictures on the right there. So at a, a temperature of zero degrees C on the condenser uh, with no gravity aid, so everything was horizontal. Uh, we demonstrated over 300 watts of power, which is pretty significant um, for this technology and that pore radius. Um, I guess the considerations or the, the other side of the coin here is generally at those higher powers, you're gonna get lower conductance values than uh, traditional loop heat pipes. So traditional loop heat pipes, that thermal interference fit is a high uh, area for fallout of parts, but whenever done correctly, it provides a very low resistance into the vapor. Uh, since you're printing this with a stainless steel envelope, we still have to attach aluminum flanges to it. Those parts grow apart differently, uh, so it does yield a higher resistance, and that's an area we're continuing to develop. And, uh, and likewise, obviously, you don't have the same uh, pore radius, so you're not going to be able to do quite as much power uh, as the traditional loop heat pipes at this point. All right. So we'll move on to thermal control here. Um, I guess some of the common options are, uh, you know, the technologies we just talked to. I talked to the ability of loop heat pipes or in effect 3D printed loop heat pipes to do that thermal control, albeit somewhat actively on the cold side. Um, you also see a lot of survival heaters to overcome those cold cases and make sure you don't drop below a detrimental temperature. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying not to, in some instances, get too hot whenever the radiator panel is seeing full sun or get too cold whenever you're in eclipse and have to use a tremendous amount of uh, heater power. So a couple of different options listed at the bottom. We'll go ahead and start at the VCHPs on the next slide here. So uh, that stands for variable conductance heat pipes. It's all in the name. Uh, depending on the temperature and power that you're operating at, you get a variable conductance. Uh, it does this because we have a reservoir at the end of the condenser, which we purposely insert non-condensable gas into. Um, that gas, in effect, has a delicate dance with the saturation pressure of the working fluid, and it will open and close the condenser. Um, we can tune that temperature at which it, it opens or closes uh, very precisely. Uh, just by sizing the reservoir uh, appropriately and inserting the correct amount of gas. Uh, so what happens basically is as you decrease in temperature, your saturation pressure of the working fluid operates under an exponential curve and the gas operates via the ideal gas law. So it's linear in nature. So for each temperature step, you can get a larger decrease in pressure or increase from the working fluid uh, relative to the non-condensable gas that allows it to push further and further out, blocking off the condenser at cold temperatures. Um, the benefit there is you do save on survival heater power at the evaporator. Uh, if you had a constant conductance heat pipe linking your evaporator to the radiator panel, it would continue pulling heat out at a very quick rate uh, relative to a VCHP. And I have a plot there on the bottom right just showing you know, your condenser temperature is dropping off and your evaporator staying nice and horizontal. Uh, just to further demonstrate what that should look like. And we do have two flavors that we'll show here on the next slide. Um, the traditional, and you know, this is under the emerging technologies. I'll get to that here momentarily. The traditional is the uh, cold bias reservoir. So you have the reservoir on the end of the condenser, as I mentioned. Um, the caveat, so this is the one that has uh, the most space flight heritage. It's used heavily whenever VCHP is required. The caveat being, while you do save on survival power on the evaporator to get very tight thermal control there, you need a little heater put onto the reservoir. 
because the reservoir is attached to the condenser. So as your uh, radiator panel decreases in temperature, so too does your gas volume. Uh, so you get a, a little bit of bleed through of the pressure differential there. Having a heater on there allows you to maintain a constant temperature, which is the low ones of watts generally uh, to maintain a temperature. And then you can tightly control the band. However, um, we do have a technology that works to do that passively. That's a warm or hot, depending on who you ask, bias reservoir. And that's shown on the right here. So um, we've done it a couple different ways to talk at it in broad strokes. The reservoir is placed on the evaporator side. So as your electronics are maintained at a constant temperature, so too is your reservoir and thus gas volume, eliminating the need to add a heater on it to maintain a certain temperature. Um, so this is something that we continue to demonstrate in the lab environment. I'd say it's uh, right around TRL 6 or so, and I uh, hope to have a flight here in the next year or two. But um, we can do it in integrated, as pictured on the bottom right, or non-integrated, where the reservoir is attached or separated from the evaporator flange and coupled with a small tube. Uh, kind of takes us to the next one. So that's for if you're attached to a radiator panel and that radiator panel is plummeting in temperature, you don't want your evaporator to fall. This is the other other side of that coin, right? So diode heat pipes um, also serve to do heat transport or two-phase heat transport in one direction. However, this looks at whenever your radiator panel gets too hot and you don't want your components to rise with it. Uh, so it does that passively, um, and we have a couple different constructions for that. Uh, there's there's three total, but the, the two most commonly used are called the vapor trap diode and the liquid trap diode. And I just have a picture here, as I did with the VCHP, on the bottom right, just showing an instantaneous temperature distribution. The far left is closer to the um, radiator panel, where you're seeing very high temperatures. Far right is your evaporator, where uh, this is a vapor. Uh, trap diode is keeping your evaporator at a nice cool temperature. So we can go to the next slide here and we'll talk through those two uh, flavors. So on the left we have the vapor trap diode. It probably looks familiar because it's a very similar construction to a VCHP. You put a reservoir at the end of the condenser. Uh, so what happens is as your uh, condenser or radiator panel increases in temperature and you're not trying to uh, apply any power at the evaporator, your uh, two-phase transport shifts and vapor starts departing from the condenser going to the evaporator. This pressure differential actually pulls the vapor front out of the reservoir and blocks the evaporator. Um, so you do have some level of two-phase transport from the condenser to somewhere in the adiabatic region, but it doesn't make it all the way to the evaporator and you can hold a very large temperature differential between the evaporator and condenser point of reference, that plot we just showed had about 300 degrees C difference there. And on the right, liquid trap does a, a similar thing in a different way. In this case, you actually have the reservoir on the evaporator side. What happens then, your reservoir, or sorry, your condenser increases in temperature. So it vaporizes the liquid in the grooves or whatever wick structure is there. It condenses in the evaporator and the reservoir. And that reservoir continues to uh, receive more and more liquid and doesn't allow it to return to the condenser. So you effectively starve your condenser um, of liquid to continue that two-phase transport um, and it'll rely solely on the conduction through the sidewall. So both uh, pretty swift, slick technologies and I'm gonna probably kick this back over to Brian to walk through PCM here. Awesome, thanks. Um, yeah, so phase change material is one other option so unlike um, heat pipe technology that's utilizing liquid to vapor, phase change material is actually using um, solid to liquid phase transition. And the reason it utilizes solid to liquid is because during that latent heat effusion stage, during the melting process, it has a kind of order of magnitude higher latent heat compared to the specific heat of the material. So that allows um, the, the PCM to kind of maintain a consistent temperature zone, as you can see in kind of the top right figure, um, where the um, specific heat line would be shown in red and the um, utilizing the latent heat in the melt zone would be shown in blue, but you can hold temperature over a given period of time during that melt phase. So it's used a lot in a couple different um, reasons for spacecraft. 
One is to control temperature during some type of event. So you don't want to overheat during a peak load of some sort. Um, so you're absorbing the heat. And that has kind of secondary benefits within the system level as well. So in, in a system that you do have a peak load, whether it's electronics that operate under a duty cycle or some type of mission profile that has a higher thermal requirement at certain areas, if you don't have this type of thermal battery in your system, you would have to size all your downstream um, cooling equipment for peak load. So that means your radiators would need the surface area required to dissipate all the heat of the peak load, um, and you would need to transport all that heat to a large enough surface area. So it, it does make the problem a lot lar larger and also makes the solution much heavier. So by introducing a PCM that can absorb that energy, you can kind of compact everything into a much more workable volume, reduce weight, reduce volume, and um, come up with a, a nice solution. And depending on how your thermal control requirements are, if you need um, you know, a tighter window or a longer period of time, you can adjust the amount of PCM you have in your system to meet those type of requirements. So it's a fairly scalable technology as well. Um, but similar to heat pipes, it's completely passive, um, no moving parts, fairly straightforward operation. So um, a fairly low risk to, to any um, thermal management system. I'm back. All right. So we're going to touch on uh, relatively quickly. I have a few slides, but uh, I think most of them can be reviewed whenever we send this out after the fact. So touch on loop heat pipes with thermal control valves. You can say, well, hey, we just touched on loop heat pipes here uh, a few minutes ago. True. So the, uh, the nifty part or clever part, I should say, here is the thermal control valve or TCV. Um, so as I mentioned, Thermal control for loop heat pipes, specifically as the condenser is dropping in temperature, is typically done actively and by heating the compensation chamber, which influences the pressure differential and shuts the system down. Um, that has been demonstrated time and time again. It's very effective. Caveat being it requires heater power. It's not passive. So situations where you have, you know, um, you want to keep your power consumption very low, that's at a premium. For instance, lunar shadow, which we'll get to here shortly, uh, those couple watts of power that are required to shut down the system and maintain that shutdown um, are, are too much to tolerate. Um, so we have demonstrated to date that passive thermal control can be done by basically plumbing in a thermal control valve into the uh, transport lines of a loop heat pipe. Um, so if you go to the next slide here, I think I have a couple of, of images as to how that's done. There we go. All right, so the industry standard valve is a proportional TCV, so it'll allow the large majority of, of, of flow through one uh, line while reducing uh, to upwards of uh, or no more than 5% of the vapor flow through the other. So on the left, you have what would be the operating loop heat pipe when you want it to. Um, it sends at least 95% of that flow to the condenser and 5% of the flow through the bypass, which gets plumbed in either to the liquid line or compensation chamber. Uh, so all things considered, it, it operates very similarly to a traditional loop heat pipe without a, a bypass. Um, on the right-hand side, um, you have whenever the TCB uh, actuates and makes 95% of the vapor flow go through the bypass, only 5% goes to the, uh, the condenser um, limiting the heat leaks uh, from what the evaporators talk or attached to to the condenser. So it does this actuation thermally. It's generally a sealed volume of of gas um, that expands or contracts with temperature, similar to our VCHP. And that expansion and contraction has a uh, an actuator internal that'll open or close one port. Um, so the caveat here, and if you go to the next slide, is that you still have that that five percent flow through the system right so that doesn't sound like a lot but for a loop heat pipe where it's imperative to keep heat leaks to your compensation chamber at a minimum for best performance um, it can have a, a significant impact there and it also uh, increases the amount of survival power needed because you do still have five percent going to the condenser when it's closed uh, and I guess one more thought is is it can influence your loop heat pipe performance in 
uh, difficult to predict ways. So we have uh, since, I, I would say probably within the past year or so, developed a few different flavors of our own thermal control valve that are more binary in nature. Uh, so they're either open or closed. Um, they have to date demonstrated good performance. I have a table here at the bottom. So the industry uh, proportional valve there is shown in red versus the two in green. Um, it shows a significant reduction in the overall leak rate that can make it through those uh, through those valves and has been plumbed into, I believe, a 3D printed loop deep pipe uh, and shown good performance. And that's covered in a very nice uh, YouTube video and uh, technical paper by Sean Honig, one of our engineers here. So we can provide some links to that information. And on the next slide, I won't touch on it too much, just the... Uh, some images that you can again find in that technical uh, publication. So the two flavors that we're looking at here are the top two open one cold. So this would be plumbed into the system very similarly to the proportional valve where you'd have it in a bypass. It'll open whenever uh, the vapor is cooled in temperature, allowing that flow to the compensation chamber instead of the uh, condenser. Closed when cold is basically just shutting off all flow through those transport lines when it gets cold. All right, and now we'll talk through the kind of last area in the um, thermal management system, which is rejecting heat. So um, the good part about deep space is you have a nice um, ambient condition. So you, you have uh, very low temperatures to reject heat to, um, but the challenge is you have no air or very low air. So um, you must do all your rejecting via radiation. So the goal here is to radiate to your external environment and the common options we'll just kind of briefly touch on are metallic radiators used a lot in um, nanosats, cubesats, small sats that are basic metal material. And then in some of the larger satellites, um, honeycomb core radiators, um, again, using aluminum or composite, but utilizing a honeycomb core to have a very robust but lightweight solution to the radiator. And then Ryan will jump on again and talk about um, an emerging option, which is our variable view factor radiator that we've been um, developing here. So yeah, looking at some of the traditional options, as I mentioned, bare aluminum, uh, if you look at the bottom left, to use a lot in, in some of those uh, small sats, cube sat type applications. Um, the aluminum honeycomb core, this is again, been an industry standard for, for many years. Um, the Honeycomb core is, is very lightweight, kind of sheet metal, um, but it does provide very, very strong um, structural strength, um, very rigid members. It can be made into a lot of different thicknesses um, and, yeah, provides good um, scalability and um, strength to weight ratio. <clears throat> um, but, yeah, it does come at, at somewhat of a, a cost compared to aluminum. And then the kind of highest performing option there would be the aluminum honeycomb core with embedded heat pipes. So that is done a lot in the industry is if you have um, heat entering your radiator at specific locations and you're generating kind of localized hotspots and you want to increase your effectiveness of your radiator and you want to spread that heat out as efficiently as possible. Um, so there you can embed heat pipes, um, typically constant conductance heat pipes with ammonia into your radiators and into the, the aluminum core radiators. Um, we, ha we actually talked about it earlier as well. You can introduce space copper water heat pipes into bare aluminum as, as a way to do the same thing, but on a smaller scale for some of the small sat applications as well. But those are kind of the traditional options. And now uh, I'll kick it over to Ryan to talk about the view factor. All right, let's let's run through this very quickly. So I think this one's pre pretty slick. So basically what we did was for an SBIR program, developed a radiator panel that will passively open or close, which changes its view factor, and that changes the amount of energy that it's dissipating at any given time. So we basically, on the bottom left-hand image there, you can kind of get a somewhat of a schematic. Uh, we have a hollow uh, sheet metal-ish structure that we charge with a certain material. That material operates under, again, a saturation pressure curve. So whenever it's very cold, it's low pressure, that radiator panel closes up. Whenever it gets hot and you want to dissipate that energy, it opens, you know, the pressure increases, it causes it to open, um, allowing for you know, 
high levels of dissipation when you want it. So bottom right hand image there just shows some thermal desktop analysis that we had and uh, kind of the result and state of the system. On the next slide here, well, yeah, that looks great on paper. Does it actually work? Um, we did build a functional prototype and tested it. So the image on the left there um, starts at 22 degrees C. You can see that it's fully closed, um, has basically no view factor to what would effectively be space. And as you continue progressing uh, in a kind of book reading uh, manner, you can see as we increase the temperature at 40-ish uh, degrees Celsius, you can see it start opening. And it gets to the mid 50s, low 60s, you're starting to uh, go beyond 90 degrees. And by the time you get to 82, you basically have, you know, nine tenths uh, of a view factor to space. Um, and you can see that graphically on the top right there, where we have a function of view factor versus the internal pressure. And the bottom right is just uh, some conceptual uh, cartoons that were made by our team on how it might be introduced into a system. So I think it's a very slick technology, definitely some some more work to be done there. Awesome, so now we'll kind of just do a, a quick summary and then we'll jump into the case study which talks through um, a couple different technologies. But just wanted to kind of wrap up. We introduced a lot of, of things today. So again, if you do have any questions, please um, type those out and we'll, we'll get to them at the end, regardless of what the technologies are. And um, as we alluded to in a lot of different slides, we also just kind of gave a high level um, perspective on these. So many of these do have white papers as well as web pages and things like that associated with them. Uh, but you're always welcome to reach out to us directly as well. And we'll, we'll get you information you need. Um, but yeah, just to summarize, the, the space industry in general is rapidly evolving. So the, the thermal technologies required is also evolving, but it's, it's one of the big enabling technologies to allow the rest of the industries to keep innovating. So there's a lot of work being done on the electronic side, on the mechanical side, um, but much of that is, is hindered by thermal performance. So the thermal technologies need to continuously evolve and, and match the other innovation within the, the industry. Um, one thing we wanted to highlight here is we do a lot of webinars on um, you know, constant conductance heat pipes and, and loop heat pipes, but we do want to kind of take a step back and say there's, there's a lot of other emerging technologies that, um, if given enough attention, can provide a lot of benefit to the industry. So we're always looking for um, partners and other companies out there to help develop these and get some flight, hard, flight heritage on these. And they could you know, help enable the rest of the industry to, to do what you guys do best. Um, and then, yeah, each mission is different and the thermal technology should match the mission profile. And that kind of segues us into our, our final case study that, that Ryan will go into. Um, if you follow us, you, you probably have saw that we uh, recently we were awarded the flight hardware for the NASA Viper program. Uh, so we're really excited to get started on the, the build phase of that. We've actually been working with NASA for many years in um, developing the technology, proving out the various concepts. Uh, very excited to get um, started on the build phase. Um, but yeah, we want to give that as kind of one use case for a, a lander profile and talk about the various technologies that go into it. So I'll throw it over to Ryan. All right, thanks again. So, um, yeah, case study in an extremely broad stroke. So, uh, Brian mentioned VIPER. We love our acronyms here. So, I have to read this. I can't recall off the top of my head. That stands for Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. Very cool. Very cool. So, what's that actually mean, though? So, it's a golf, uh, golf cart sized uh, robotic rover in support of the uh, the Artemis program with the end goal of getting a sustainable human presence on the lunar surface. Um, what is it actually doing? It's landing and exploring the south pole of the moon, uh, basically in, in permanently shadowed regions, uh, to dig into the regolith and check for uh, composition and I believe the concentration of ice deposits available. If they find it, you can separate those into hydrogen, oxygen, and uh, make those into fuel for sustainable presence. Um, the challenge being, surviving lunar shadow is some of the, the coldest places in the, in the galaxy. Uh, so, um, and it's, it's in shadow for uh, 14 Earth days. So what that means is every watt of power 
that needs to go towards keeping this warm enough that it's uh, very precise, very technologically advanced components don't don't break um, is about five kilograms of, of battery mass. So a uh, little picture on the bottom there, the Viper Rover is actually sitting on top of that structure. If we go to the, the next slide here, uh, what ACT's part was in this, in this whole thing was to support uh, initially the EDU fabrication and testing of some of the more advanced uh, thermal control hardware uh, to achieve the lowest possible survival heater power necessary. So we had two competing architectures mainly. One was the, uh, the primary architecture or the loop heat pipe with thermal control valve to try and passively reduce heat loss through any two phase to the radiator panel from what it was keeping warm or cold. And the secondary was just traditional cold reservoir VCHPs. Um, and we would build those, they would assemble or integrate them into a mock structure and uh, have since completed their thermal vacuum uh, testing and characterization of the two technologies. Um, that, that testing was successful. Uh, we were able to substantially reduce the survival heater power required if we were just using a traditional uh, loop heat pipe without the thermal control valve. They are currently planning and we're on contract to provide um, the loop heat pipes with thermal control valves to support their mission. And uh, I guess more, more publications to come, uh, including some of that test data and, and uh, orders of magnitude in terms of um, how much we were able to reduce the survival power there. So yeah, uh, at this point, we'll kind of start going through the questions. And yeah, we, we couldn't share a ton on the, the NASA Viper. So if you read through some of our uh, press, you've probably seen a lot of that information, but we thought it was a good example to kind of just show how various technologies kind of work. Um, together to, to provide system level um, design and uh, capabilities to something as important as the, the, the uh, Viper program. And we do want to thank our, our uh, collaborators at NASA. They've been really excellent to work with and um, yeah, we, we're very proud to be selected for that program. So with that, um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of check off. Brian will be taking questions and we want to thank everyone for joining and please keep the questions coming as we as we answer them.